I'm going, I'm going, taking a step back a bit, I think. I think Alistair talked about interception and long-term storage, and I'm not sure whether those terms are familiar terms to all of you, but uh, if they are, I'm sorry, but, but, my, but I, I'm going sort of back to basics and uh, I'm making the assumption that some of you are, are quite new to SUDS. Um, uh, I think it's probably also worth saying at this stage is that, is that despite the fact that I'm talking about hydraulics and then Steve's talking about water quality, uh, SUDS need to be an, an integrated approach from the start and, 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 and hydraulics, water quality and amenity are not building blocks that happen one after the other. They all, to, to, make, to, to, to ensure that you get the best SUDS scheme, the whole lot needs to be put in the pot at the, at the beginning along with the development layout and the, the planning objectives and environmental objectives of the development. So um, I am just going to focus on the hydraulics, but that's not really, <laughs> that's not really how it shouldn't be taken in isolation. Um, so as I said, I, I'm going to start, start from the basics. Uh, I'll go through it quite quickly because I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. But this is a greenfield environment. This is the greenfield site. Uh, you've got very little surface flow. You've got a, a lot of subsurface base flows and interflows. And, and, uh, you, 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 and the result is a, is a, protect, is a pristine sort of natural, natural environment, natural, natural water course, um, which is quite resilient um, to, um, or relatively resilient to, to flood risk. Um, then we put our, um, our development on these Assyria images, but I thought they probably weren't, weren't quite developed enough. But, but what happens is you reduce dramatically your interflow and base flow um, processes. You increase uh, considerably your surface flow. You put it into a big pipe, and um, the watercourse at the end becomes, um, uh, it, it deteriorates uh, and becomes um, impacted by the development. And, and that, that is what we're trying to address with SUDS. We've, we've, we understand that, the, that our approaches to urban runoff control have not been um, necessarily the, the right way for, for in the past, and that with SUDS we're trying to keep our development, um, put in our, um, uh, integrate our sustainable uh, drainage systems w within our development to deliver uh, amenity and biodiversity and, and urban surface water management and still have our protected natural water courses um, at the, at the downstream um, point. So in a slightly more quantitative approach, uh, th this, th these are putting some numbers to, to actually what's going on. Uh, of the rainfall that, that, that falls out of the sky that, that lands on the surface of our, of our catchments, uh, almost 40% of it is returned to the atmosphere by, um, by evapotranspiration. 25% uh, of it, all these are obviously approximate, uh, helps recharge our groundwater. 25% of it will find its way into the rivers, but will sustain the base flows that we need um, to, to sustain the ecology and morphology of the river on, on a continuous basis. And only 10% of it will um, deliver the temporary surface flows as a result of rainfall, r rainfall events. As we, as we increase the development within our catchment, we have a big impact on the, on the amount of water that is infiltrated, both shallow infiltration and deep infiltration, and we uh, increase dramatically our, the, the proportion which um, uh, it runs off as, as surface, surface water flows. And then, of course, uh, when you get a very dense urban environment, almost all of it, everything that comes out of the sky ends up in the, either in the watercourse as as flood as, uh, as temporary flood flows or ends up on the ground as surface pluvial, pluvial flooding. Right, so the national standards, um, I think someone mentioned 2004, but it does feel as though they have been going on since 2004. Um, I feel like <laughs> I've been rewriting them since 2004, um, but I've been uh, different. I'm sure everyone knows, has been drafting these national standards in order to uh, as part of the implementation of Schedule 3 of the Flood and Water Management Act. Um, and all SUDs that uh, to be adopted by the SABs are going to have to uh, meet the criteria set out in the national standards. Um, you may, I'm sure you've all probably read, read the original standards that were published for consultation in December 2011. Since then, um, the words have changed quite a number of times, uh, but most recently they've become much more high level, so a lot of the numbers have, ha, have gone and, um, and they'll become more based on the generic objectives. And I would say that the, the, the generic objectives actually haven't changed at all, um, and the detail will now move from the standards into the supporting, supporting guidance. So I'm going to focus on the objectives in case they change between now and next week, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and talk through those. Uh, 
So, so really, the, f the first objective of the standards is to try and prioritise infiltration, and I hope the slides previously emphasised why that is so important. Um, it supports flood risk management, it, it puts water back into the uh, groundwater resources rather than um, ending up in the river where it shouldn't be. It uh, controls pollution, um, it doesn't end up in combined sewers and therefore controls near those spills, and it protects the base flows of the watercourses. <coughs> so that's what the standards are, are saying is that you need to prioritise infiltration unless of course there's an environmental risk associated with that infiltration process in which case you need to either manage that risk or, or use another uh, disposal route. You then prioritise surface water bodies, um, so, um, or surface water drainage systems, surface drainage systems, um, so uh, uh, before, unless that's not practicable for some reason, or the local flood risk management strategy says that's not a good idea. Um, subsurface infrastructure is, is a lower priority, a low, uh, and you need to really demonstrate why, um, why you're why you need to put water into a, a receiving sewer because that's likely to have much limited, uh, much more limited capacity, be much less adaptable to climate change and urban creep in the future and have maintenance issues. Um, and then the combined sewer be, will be your last resort because obviously there you've got associated s risks from CSO spills. Um, the foul sewer is absolutely a, a no so um, and not, not, not allowed. Um, the, the second objective from the national standard is to try and mimic those greenfield response characteristics for, um, of, of the site. Uh, and by doing that, by keeping regular flows um, in a similar state to, to that which would have happened in a greenfield environment, you are then protecting the ecology and morphology of the, of the water body. And um, by, protecting, by, by controlling your flood flows, you're minimizing the impact on, on flood, of the development on flood risk. An important issue uh, for greenfield sites is that um, there really isn't, for a very large number of events, any runoff from a greenfield site. So for rainfall events of less than five millimetres, um, most of the time you don't get any runoff at all. Uh, and, and those rainfall depths of less than five millimetres happen, well, well at least 50% of, of, of every rainfall event during the year is less than five millimetres. Um, so if you can imagine... Uh, that uh, then you put a development in and suddenly your receiving stream has, um, has short, sharp bursts of runoff for every one of those rainfall events, then obviously there's going to be a considerable damage caused. Uh, and that, that, that sort of damage will, be, will, will manifest itself as an eroded incised channel, um, a poorly functioning floodplain, sedimentation, but with depressed water table, because you won't have got, any of the, you won't have got much of that um, interflow, that... Um, uh, the, the, the shallow infiltration, uh, and if you can imagine all those rainfall events that don't normally cause, cause runoff all being associated with a pollution load, you're obviously going to have a lot more sediment and a lot more pollution um, ending up in your, in your water body. Uh, so how can we design systems so that the site does not uh, deliver runoff for, for um, small rainfall events? Well, you can put it in infiltration systems, and ideally you would have prioritised those anyway, so, so those are likely to manage significantly in excess of five mil of rainfall. You can take water out using rainwater harvesting systems, as provided you've got a guaranteed regular demand and the water's not just going to sit there. Um, green roofs, that'll take out five millimetres um, without any problem. Um, permeable pavements, again, even if they're lined or have very low infiltration rates, still the, it's been demonstrated that you, ha you generally don't get runoff from pavements for that sort of size of event. Even swales and, and trenches, as long as they've got some, some engineered soils around them or as long as they've got a, some very low infiltration rates, you'll be able to get rid of five mil. Detention basins the same. So all vegetative systems are going to deliver that. But you're not going to get it with a, with a pipe and a tank. So the next, the, next thing that you, the, the next objective is to control your peak runoff rates. You, you, we fo the national standards focus on one year because one year is when the t mostly the receiving water bodies tend to be full, about bank full. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you're not increasing that frequency because otherwise you're going to cause damage. Um, and the other thing is 100 year because that's, and that is taken as the, as the, the flood risk uh, management event. So we need to, to make sure that at one year events, you're only going to, you're going to get dis uh, greenfield discharge rates and in 100 year events, you're going to get dis greenfield discharge rates and you're controlling the runoff at the point of discharge from your development to the receiving catchment. And why do you want to do this? 
well, this is, this is the runoff from a development site, and you get a much more rapid peak discharge, uh, and you can see the green field is a much lower, smoother one, and, and, uh, and so we need to manage that. This is the frequency curve, so uh, a green field frequency curve will look something like the below one. The, the brown field developed green field, uh, frequency curve will be much much higher, and you need to bring it all, ideally bring it all down. You may not match it exactly, but um, it's got to be in a similar order. And how do you do it? Well, you put in attenuation storage systems. Your Q in, your flow going into the storage system is going to be much bigger than your flow out of the storage system. Um, the storage system is going to fill, um, and, and, and then it will be released once, there is, um, what, once the inflow has, has reduced. So uh, how, how can you... And the, ways in which you can deliver it. You've obviously got surface pond systems. You've got dry detention systems. Um, you've got permeable pavement systems to store, store water in the sub-base. Um, this is one of, all these are pictures from, most of them are pictures from Bob Bray, who I'm sure everyone's heard about. And his, uh, he and Steve have designed lots of beautiful systems. I think this one's in Stanford, um, which has got rills, um, uh, concrete rills through the development, which, which are store, uh, which, can, which store water and it's controlled at the downstream point, point of discharge. Um, d different flow control systems, I could, could show you any number, but um, I think this is, this, this one might be, is that Lamb Lam Drove? So this is a, a small V-notched weir um, control system. This is one of Bob's uh, um, orifice control systems that he puts in a, a manhole cover, which allows you to control uh, the one-year flow, and then a higher control for your for your higher order, higher return period events. So there are lots of different ways of doing it, and all these different control systems and different storage systems will be um, are are in the SUDS manual at the moment and will be um, updated in the in the next version. And you don't always have to put storage in a single system. Obviously, storage can be distributed. So uh, this is another of Bob's Bob's sites, but but it just shows that. You can distribute attenuation storage at, at source and, um, and through conveyance systems, and then you can reduce the size of your um, downstream system. So you, you're not putting everything in a big storage system at the bottom, which is not usually going to be a cost-effective way of controlling volumes of uh, flows. Um, yeah, you, so at source, again, that, that, that sort of source attenuation, this is um, putting, putting attenuation systems in and, and check dams to making sure that you're make, making the most of your storage within your conveyance swales and, and here is a more regional more, more regional attenuation system in an in an open thing. Where's the evidence? Well this is Lamb Drove monitoring um, that, that Furler was involved with and you can see that that from the rainfall the control site, which is a developed site, shows you a very peaky, very rapid rate of runoff and the suds the sud system, the outflow from the sud system is the green line at the bottom, obviously very, very much a depressed response. The next thing to control is the volume of the runoff, um, and the focus here is on flood risk management. So you need to control a one in a year, one in a hundred year runoff volume to the greenfield development, greenfield equivalent. So that's not the peak discharge; it's the volume underneath the hydrograph. It's the actual quantity, physical quantity of water that is leaving the development site at extreme events. And you have to decide on a, on a duration of that event. And six hour has been taken as probably a suitable event duration, which reflects events that might impact on receiving catchment response. And wh why? I think you can see that when rivers flood, um, and you, especially when you've got lots of um, control structures across the floodplain, uh, when everything goes out of bank, then actually the water levels are more likely to be controlled by the volume, physical volume of water in them than the, than the actual rate of flow. So the, what we call the long-term storage volume is the difference between the runoff volume from the development and the runoff volume that would have happened in a greenfield state for that specific event that you've identified. And that will end up, so all that hatched area, that's, all, that's the difference in volume between one and the other. And all that volume will need to be managed in a way in which does not contribute to, to an increased flood risk. And this is Nick from Syria, a Syria training course. But effectively, you can either take approach one where you you, you, you put everything, you, you have an atten you have your interception storage, you have an attenuation storage, and then you have, and then you control your flows to your one year and your 100 year greenfield. And then when that volume reaches a specific, reaches your greenfield run of volume, you discharge it into a, you take it out of the system and make sure it, that discharge is either, is either infiltrated or is discharged at a very low rate. 
of the order of two litres per second per hectare, which is going to definitely not exacerbate flood risk in the receiving water body. The other approach, of course, is just to use a single system where all of the, the entire volume is, is combined with your attenuation storage for your peak flows, and then you just control the whole lot to a, to a, low, a low flow rate. And the fourth and the final objective for, uh, for flow, managing flows is, is making absolutely sure that when, when the events exceed the capacity of the drainage system, so when you ha have more than 100 year or um, more than the design capacity of your drainage system, um, that, that, you're not going to, that you're not going to put people, property and the environment at, or the environment at risk. Obviously, that's a fine balance and there will come a point at which there is a risk to people, but you, uh, the designer will need to make sure that he's considered... Um, what happens and that as soon as the drainage system doesn't fill um, you're not then discharging it into an old people's home or uh, into a hospital front entrance or something so you need to um, you, you may find you, it may be it may be cost effective to allow certain areas to flood during extreme you may elect to flood landscape areas you may elect to protect landscape areas but and route exceedance flows to specific designated storage facilities Roads, car parks might also be, be areas that might be allowed to flood during extreme events, but, also, but obviously the depths and the velocities of the, of the flooding would have to be um, weighed up against the usage of that road and, um, and the management criteria. I mean, SUS design is, is all, all about taking account of the benefits of, of the potential for multifunctionality for development infrastructure and for the SUDS infrastructure. So just a few tools that, that are available to help you. Um, Hopefully the SUDS manual is one, but I don't know if people know about um, UKSUDS.com, which um, has tools on it which allow you to estimate greenfield runoff rates. You can then um, look at, you can, then you, there's another tool for, to estimate attenuation and long-term storage volumes. Um, at least this might be a, a good check. You can design rainwater harvesting systems, or the volumes of rainwater harvesting systems for stormwater control. There are site evaluation tools and... and will be cost tools as well. And, and those, two, those two tools are based on this EA report, report which, is, uh, which is also on that website. It looks a bit like this. You click on, your, you click on the map, you get the rainfall data, you, uh, uh, and then it calculates, calculates greenfield runoff rates. This is the rainwater harvesting uh, tool, and this is the surface water storage tool. You have to put in characteristics of your development, and then it works out an approximate storage figure. That's it. Thank you.